Yeah, dude. You can't tell the story of Jackass without the story of skateboarding videos. And the first commercial skateboarding video came out in 1984. It was called the Bones Brigade Video Show. And it showed a very young Tony Hawk just ripping in a way the world had never seen. I got my first skateboard in 1985, but at that time, the skateboard industry was so small, it was very dependent upon the approval of mothers. So in the videos, they were very careful not to make it look too dangerous. Whenever they showed slams, nothing was too violent. They really did their best to make it look cute. In 1990, my dad won a video camera in a corporate golf tournament. I stole it from his closet and I started making my own video. And around the time I was making my first video, this pro skateboarder named Steve Rocco, who owned a skateboard company called World Industries, said, you know what? We're not kissing mom's ass. We're gonna make a video that's super gnarly and shows skateboarding for what it is. And he set about making his first video called Rubbish Heap. He didn't really have anybody to make the video, but there was a photographer for World Industries named Spike Jones. And if that name rings a bell, he is an Academy Award winning movie director. But his first ever video project was the Rubbish Heap video, which featured pro skateboarders making a kid eat an earthworm and the kid barfs and the dog eats the barf. And that Rubbish Heap video opened up the door for skateboarding videos to include just crazy wild crap. By that point, street skating got so good, I could no longer compete. So I made it my business to just do stunts so that I could be in skateboard videos, but not as a skateboarder. And I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico to live with my sister, and that's when I went hard with it. Fire and flying off buildings and just handstands on moving cars. And all the while, Steve Rocco was just becoming more and more powerful. And he got more and more crazy. So to promote World Industries, he would make these insane ads. And one of them was of a little kid holding a gun to his head. And the two biggest skateboarding magazines, Thrasher and Transworld, both sent the ad back to him saying, look, there's no way we're going to run that. And he said, oh, you don't like my ad? Well, how about this? I'm not going to take any more ads out in your dumb magazines and I'm gonna start my own magazine. And that was how Big Brother Magazine started. For the purpose of being naughty. Big Brother would be the place that brought together all of the characters you would come to know from Jackass. Chris Pontius was a writer. You couldn't have Jackass without Big Brother because Big Brother was like a magnet to all the misfits in the skateboard world. Jeff Tremaine was the editor-in-chief. We were hiding behind skateboarding and making a, a ridiculous just, magazine just to entertain us. We Man was in like the mailroom, dude. <laughs> I get all the stacks of magazines and I'm just shoving them in envelopes and putting oh. in people's addresses that were subscribed to them uh. and then mailing them off. It was a skateboarding magazine being sold to children in skate shops and it was full of nudity. They had tits on the cover. Skateboarders being crucified on the cover. Skaters jumping over burning Bibles. They had articles about how to kill yourself. Like literally, like the most effective ways how to make fake IDs, how to buy crack in bad neighborhoods. It was so fucking insane that the pornographer Larry Flint found out about it and he was like, I like it. So Steve Rocco sold it to him. Somebody needs to be pushing the limits of the First Amendment all the time to make sure we're getting our money's worth. When I was in Albuquerque and Big Brother came through town, I made it my business to track those fuckers down and get in the magazine. And I did. I found them at a skate park. I said, dudes, I'm going to be in the magazine because what I'm going to do tonight is going to be so crazy. And I ended up setting myself on fire and burning the skin off of half my face. And those burns were terrible, 
but I got a little article in Big Brother. It was called The Burning Boy Festival. And I would become a regular character in the magazine. I was even on the cover doing a handstand ho-ho plant with one leg. And Johnny Knoxville started showing up in Big Brother when he decided to do a review of self-defense equipment. The self-defense equipment was the first time in my life where I felt like I had momentum. He got shot with red pepper spray. Hit me! <laughs> and stun gun. Charge! And a taser gun. Weren't you on 90210 not too long? Ah! Ah! And then actually put on a bulletproof vest and shoot himself with a 38 caliber handgun. Jeff Tremaine said, go ahead and make sure you video that because they also made videos which came out periodically to kind of color in the behind the scenes of it all. The Big Brother videos were basically jackass before jackass, and they had all these bits in them that would end up being refilmed for the show. This sausage doesn't look right. It looks a little like poo. The sausage looks like poo. Well, just bum fish, dude. <laughs> these videos became insanely popular, and Jeff Tremaine and Johnny Knoxville decided to reach out to Spike Jones and say, hey, we think if we take out the skateboarding, What's left over could be a great TV show. The Big Brother, you know, it was about personalities. The big, right. the big personalities in skateboarding more so than the great skateboarding that's happening. So that's what they did, man. They subtracted the skateboarding, and what was left over was Knoxville, Wee Man, Steve-O, Pontius. And then they added Dave England and Danger Aaron from Blunt Snowboarding Magazine, as well as Johnny Knoxville's buddy Preston Lacey, and joined forces with Bam and his CKY stuff, made a tape, and called it Jackass. And Dick House, the iconic production company, was born. They brought their tape to HBO, and that meeting went horribly. But then they brought it to MTV, and MTV loved it. So Jackass premiered on MTV in the year 2000. And very shortly after that, little kids were showing up in hospitals all over the place. MTV got very scared about lawsuits. So they started coming up with new rules that we had to follow and censoring footage that we shot. And Noxo was like, hey man, I'm not gonna do a watered down version of Jackass. Like, I quit. And like, we were all like, Noxo, what do you mean? And I'll tell you what he meant. Like, this is a sacred fucking thing. <laughs> and it's going to be the way we want it to be. Just like Steve Rocco always said, fuck, you don't like it, fuck you. Knoxville quit the TV show, but got us a movie deal. Because with the protection of the R rating, we didn't have to worry about little kids so much. So that's how it went from TV to movies. And dude, the first movie was 20 years ago. There's so much history, there's so much crazy behind the scenes stories that if you haven't read my first book, Professional Idiot, you need to. And you gotta get my second book, which just became available for pre-order. It's called A Hard Kick in the Nuts, What I've Learned from a Lifetime of Terrible Decisions. And I want it to do really well, so please get behind it, hit the link in the video description and pre-order your copy. You can order signed copies if you choose the right distributor. And yeah, again, please do that. And thank you for learning about the history of Jackass. Yeah. <laughs>